Hi everyone, Wismeril here. Today I want to bring you the second video in this mini-series dedicated to PvP in order to make it accessible for new players, whether you're new, casual or a veteran but you're not really aware of, of what's going on in the dueling area, in the PvP area, in the fields of hatred. So uh, today's video will be about bringing you a very optimized starter build for the Sorcerer. I chose the Sorcerer for two reasons. Obviously, that's the main class I play, so that's the one I know most. And uh, you're, if you're playing Season 2 right now in PvE, you are very likely to have rolled a Sorcerer during Season 2, because Ball Lightning being so strong in PvE, it's no wonder uh, a lot of people chose that route to farm their uh, unique items, their other unique items, uh, in a very easy way. So for all those reasons combined, I chose that the first build I'm going to cover as a starter build for PvP is going to be the Ball Lightning Sorcerer. This video is the second part of a series of three. If you haven't watched yesterday's video, I recommend you do so because this is where I did cover the hidden breakpoints in PvP. You see, if you bring your PvE optimized character in PvP, it's not gonna go well because unlike in PvE, there are some hidden caps. Those hidden caps, uh, long story short, are for damage reduction, it's capped at 45%. For armor, you don't want to go beyond 9,217 and resistances are uncapped and for the rest you really want to work out a heavy uh, health pool and some barriers here and there. You will find all the details in yesterday's video which I'm going to link at the end of this video and in the description uh, if I didn't forget by the time I edit my stuff. Right, this being said, I'll be assuming that you know and understand those hidden caps and I'm going to walk you through this setup that I have for you. Complete setup is going to include all the paragon boards, the skill tree, vampiric powers, your gear and the roads. And I'm going to explain the choices here and there. Um, one side note, it's hard, it, not hard, it's difficult to do a one-size-fits-all uh, build that's going to be for new players, casual players or veterans, but I did my best trying to bring you something that's very solid, that you're going to have an easy time um, beginning with and that you can master on the way as you're going to spend more and more time in the fields of hatred. I'm going to give you some hints here and there on the possible changes that you can do once you do uh, master this build. The first version, this version, is really made for new players. If you don't have any experience in the fields of hatred, this build is for you. It is very safe. It's ticking all the boxes. Super solid, like it's um, with decent gear. I will uh, give a word on that in a second. You're going to reach those hidden breakpoints. You don't have to max out everything. I made it in a way that it's achievable to really reach those breakpoints without having to farm for days and days. Um, except for the Uber Unique, but we're going to talk about that. So, uh, from a, a gear standpoint, it's 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 doable to assemble it maybe in a week if you're just trying out a PvP or new to a Diablo 4, maybe in a week you can assemble that. Um, if you are uh, more experienced by just swapping a few things here and there, you will get something pretty solid as well. And for new players, really like those skills and the rotation that I'm going to talk about is very easy. You like the, the way I see things is I don't want you to focus too much on wait, this thing is doing that when this condition is met. No, no, no. Everything's pretty simple. Just I want you to focus on paying attention in the fights that you're going to take versus enemies. I don't want you to think, uh, well, wait, I have to wait for that cooldown to be up so that I get this interaction going on. No, just You'll be pressing your buttons, you know, without thinking too much about it and you'll be looking at what your opponent's doing, you'll be looking at your your positioning, how you're going to approach the fight, you're trying to read 
Is he having some buffs ongoing? What's, what's going on with his character? What are, uh, and then you can focus on optimizing the fight from that standpoint. So that's what I really try to um, get going with this approach. Right, enough for the introduction. Let's jump into the details. Um, let's start with the gear. So for the gear, as you can see, a realistic goal for you is to assemble this gear having an eye level, internal level of 860. The maximum is 925, but I made the breakpoints achieved if you have gear for like 860 eye level and forward. Same for the jewelry. Having those um, eye level on your gear will get you to the um, breakpoints that I'm going to touch shortly. And then for the rolls themselves, first you want to focus on having gear that have all those rolls, that have three out of four, so you can get the fourth one out of the occultist by enchanting your items. And then when you do have some piece of gear that has those three to four affixes, I'm going to tell you which ones are super important to get to a certain breakpoint and which one you don't care the value. Like, like for instance, if we look at this chest armor, the shadow resistance, it can be another resistance like um, uh, poison or maybe cold. I'll, I'll, dive into that. I'll dive into that in a second. But the role can be 30.8% uh, uh, onwards out of 60, so it's fairly easy to get that. Just get the roll, don't mind too much the value, you're very likely to have a roll higher than 31 and you're good to go. Right, now let's look at how the build is made. First, I want to talk about gear in conjunction with vampiric powers. Let's start with your weapon. In PvP, it is very important to be highly mobile, especially if you're rocking a ball lightning build where you have to stand on top of your opponent for damage to happen. And being highly mobile, you will have the opportunity to outplay the opponent, to not walk on those firewalls, to, you know, dodge um, those poison rapid fire attacks and so on and so forth. We're doing that by having the Oculus, Hesus Heirloom, and metamorphosis. The combination of those three is pretty strong. The Oculus is going to give you the teleport enchantment for free, but it's going to take you to a random location. This is overwritten by the metamorphosis vampiric power. Um, your te teleport enchantment is no more a teleport enchantment, it is an evade, so you can't evade from the top of a cliff to the bottom of a cliff. That's one thing to keep in mind. It's not going to be a teleport anymore, it's going to be an evade. It's not going to trigger a barrier because of the protection node over here, and it's not going to give you, well, we don't have the 30% damage reduction, but it wouldn't do that if we had that. Okay, so the interaction of those two is very important. I'm pretty sure you're familiar with that if you build your... Uh, sorcerer with a ball lightning build. The other thing this thing is doing is look at the affixes. There's a hell lot of ranks to teleport. It's lowering the, its cooldown. Um, it's having plus three maximum evade charges. That's a total of four you're gonna have. And every time you attack, you can attack thin air. Every time you press a button, that's how it reads, you're going to reduce evade's cooldown by 1.2 seconds. You teleport, that's 1.2 seconds less on evade. You cast one ball lightning, that's 1.2 seconds less. That's how it works. The damage, we don't care that much, it's additive damage. It's probably the least important factor. Um, you're looking to have a 925 Oculus, that's the first thing you want to have, the highest internal level power, and then if you have the luxury to choose between a few that are 924, look for maximum evade charges and attacks, reduce evade cooldown, look for the higher value when it's reducing uh, your cooldown. Right, now let's talk about Jesus Heirloom. How does this interact with those two? The prefix on Jesus Heirloom is Evade grants you 75% movement, movement speed additive for three seconds. Guess what? You have Evade, like there's no tomorrow. You'll be able to dash pretty much everywhere all the time. If you do your things right, if you recharge your Evades with a few, a few attacks here and there. 
And every time you evade, for three seconds, you're going to benefit from plus 75% movement speed. And if you have a good roll on the movement speed prefix on your boots, the first line over here, you're going to have 100% bonus movement speed. This is the cap. You start at 100 base movement speed and you can only have 100% bonus movement speed, reaching, getting you to 200% movement speed, right? So by just having one movement speed roll on your boots and having that, you'll be capped out most of the time at 200% movement speed. You uh, evade through metamorphosis to a location you can control, bang, you're moving for three seconds at 75% movement speed. The combination of those three is pretty solid. So it will help you to close the gap between uh, you and the enemy it will help you to dodge some skills such as uh, poison rapid fire attack from rogue's opponent if you happen to be against one and having uh, a maxed out movement speed will do a few nice things for you on the legendary power of those boots it's going to give you an additive 30% increased critical strike chance, which is very good in that build because we are not rocking the Elementalist Legendary, giving you up to 60% uh, increased uh, critical strike chance, depending on your mana. We're not doing that. So we're very happy to get the 30% additive critical strike chance over there. Plus, it's going to, thanks to this busted Vampiric Power in Season 2, Ravenous, it's going to give you some uh, increased attack speed. Um, that's going to scale all the way to 80%. If you're at 100% base movement speed, that's 40% attack speed, increased attack speed. And when you are at 200% total movement speed, it's going to be 80% increased attack speed. This attack speed is going to funnel nicely in ball lightning, having the damage ticking, I think it's uh, base 3.3 uh, 3 .3 times a second, and I think you can scale it all the way uh, 10 times a second, if I'm not mistaken. I'd have to read my notes, I'm not too sure. But the, the thing you have to remember is this will funnel into dealing more damage with ball lightning. So the combination of those two Vampiric powers and those two uh, unique items is pretty solid, very good start. More mobility, more damage, more outplay, more skilled things in PvP. Because uh, PvP is mostly about skill. <laughs> A little bit about knowledge, bug knowledge and stuff, but yeah, uh, you, you definitely need those, right? So that's how we're going to start uh, with this build. Uh, those boots are super nice because they include mana cost reductions, which is not included in some other unique boots, and I really love those ones. They're super nice. Critical Strike Damage is an additive bonus. Uh, we, we won't explain too much on that. The third unique item I want to talk about is T-Bolt's Wheel. By the way, everything I'm showing you here is best in slot. This is what I recommend you run the build with. This is how it's been optimized. Don't swap your items too much. You might bre uh, break some breakpoints and and you won't have the most optimized way to start your adventure in the PvP environment. Let's talk about the third one, T-Bolt's Wheel. This one is doing a few very nice things for us. In the continuation of this metamorphosis plus Oculus interaction, so when we evade, uh, we become unstoppable for four seconds, right? And thanks to T-Bolt's Wheel, every time we become unstoppable, we gain 50 of our primary resource. This 50 is multiplied by our mana generation. I'll touch on that in a moment. For now, let's just say it's going to be 50 times 1.8, let's say. So you're getting a lot of mana every time you become unstoppable. Now you have to know one thing. T-Bolt's Wheel, I'm sorry, um, Metamorphosis, when you use evade, it's going to make you unstoppable and it's going to last for four seconds. If you want to become unstoppable again, you have to wait for four seconds. You have to wait for the um, broken chains icon on top of your character to disappear for you to become unstoppable again. If you do another metamorphosis while you're unstoppable, you will extend the duration of you being unstoppable, but you will not become unstoppable again. Mind the wording, because this has an, an impact on T-Bolt's will. This gives you 50 mana times 1.8 only when you become unstoppable, when you, when, not when you extend the duration. So in your spell rotation, if you really like, if you want to quickly recharge your mana, 
you will have to use um, evade carefully, like you have to evade, wait for four seconds for the broken chain icon to disappear, to evade once more and get 50 times 1.8 uh, resource back. If you extend the duration, it's not going to do anything mana wise. Okay, keep this interaction in mind. Don't think about too many things if you're new and trying this out, just like the mana will flow with this build, it's pretty, it's pretty optimized. But then once you start to master the build, you will pay attention to those details because they can be life saving sometimes in PvP. Um, the other part of this uh, awesome pair of pants is that it's going to give you a huge multiplier on a defensive slot, a 40% damage multiplier while you are unstoppable and for four seconds after. So unlike the um, mana generation part, uh, it's not when you become unstoppable, it's when you are unstoppable. So you, you can extend the duration of your metamorphosis unstoppable for as long as you want and this is going to last for that duration plus four seconds. If I ev evade and two seconds after that I event, evade once more, I would have been unstoppable for six seconds and this buff would have been running for 10 seconds. Very strong. On the affixes uh, side of this thing, the prefix, uh, it's a nice to have, but the affixes themselves, we are really looking for maximum resource and damage reduction from close enemies. Maximum resource is very nice. Usually we can only get that on helm and rings. Having this unique helm and this unique ring, we don't have those uh, max mana rolls. We can on only have it on a regular ring. So therefore, having one more roll on the pants is appreciated. It's very nice. I'll tell you why in a second. Uh, the second, the most, if I would say the most important affix you're looking on those pants after the multiplier value, of course, you're looking to have a 40%. And the second one you're looking to have is as close to the maximum on damage reduction from close enemies. This is in order to reach the breakpoint of 45% damage reduction. Check yesterday's video if you want a full uh, highlight on that. But basically we are reaching those 45% damage reduction in two ways. You want to have 45% damage reduction from distant enemies and from close enemies so that you don't have to think about anything to benefit from the maximum damage reduction. You don't have to set enemies ablaze and be dancing uh, a few things while it's Monday and it's raining. No, no, no you'll be benefiting from the 45% damage reduction period. And to do that, you need to have the highest roll you can find on those pants along playing, where are you, the territorial grief, uh, glyph, I'm sorry, for 15, it's bugged, something's going on with max roll, uh, for a 15% damage reduction against close enemies. The combination of having uh, as close to 20 as possible and 15 over here along the 20% damage reduction, a general damage reduction, will get you to 45% damage reduction. We are doing the same with the chest armor. This 18.9% damage reduction from distant enemies uh, along uh, another 18.9% damage reduction from distant enemies along the 20% general damage reduction from uh, Shaco, that's how you're going to achieve 45% damage reduction from close, 45% damage reduction from distant. And you're good to go, you don't need to think about it. So that's for the pants. Next, um, yeah, let's cover the, uh, let's, let's continue with the chest armor. So chest armor, the break point you wanna have on chest and amulet is going to be 18.9 on each of them. A little bit more, you, you could realistically reach this uh, value because look at the range, it ranges from 13.9 up to 23.7. So it's realistic on an item that's gonna be 860 eye level to look for a role that's going to be minimum 18.9 on the chest. If you have more on the chest, that's great news because finding a quad factor amulet that is an amulet with the four affixes you're looking for ain't no easy in Diablo 4. So you're not likely to have an easy time finding an amulet like this one with at least 18.9% um, damage reduction. 
So look, it's easier to have a high value he here on damage reduction from distance and get a lower value here. And if you're lucky enough, the combination, the inverted multiplication of those two plus uh, uh, Shaco is going to reach 45%. If you want to see the calculation, look at yesterday's video. Uh, let's continue. Let's finish with the chest armor. So you're looking to have um, a high percent total armor roll. You really need to focus when you're choosing your chest armor on those two roles. Damage reduction from distant enemies, high, how, uh, how, how high as possible, as high as possible, I'm sorry, <laughs> didn't sleep much. And percentage total armor as high as possible. You're looking to have 26.2% minimum on the roll if you have every item 860 uh, eye level plus Shaco that's always going to be 925. And if you have that along the legendary power of this chest armor, saying you when you are in combat, uh, long story short, you will have a multiplier of 1.66 on your armor and this having a 26.2% total armor roll plus having the max value it's realistic to get that I have, I have found a lot of them during my farming so having a max roll on the disobedience the combination of those two plus items 860 high level will get you to 9 will get you to more than 9217 armor when you are in combat that is when you're dealing damage so that disobedience is doing its magic then you're going to be capped out on physical damage reduction and it is very important in the meta uh, barbarians are, are playing uh, what's it called bleed um, so Armor reduces physical damage. Physical damage is bleed or any uh, hits that you are taking from enemies. So you want to reduce that value to the maximum. Armor is a kind of damage reduction that only applies to physical damage, i.e. hits you are taking and bleed. And if you have 9,217, if you have more than this number, you are going to reduce any physical damage, bleed and hits, by 85%. It is like having an, a resistance here that will say physical resistance and that you can get all the way up to 85% and by having 9,217 plus armor, this is how you reach physical resistance, reduce your damage by 85% and you do need that against those barbs, right? So this is how you're going to reach the breakpoint. The least two important roles, like you want to have them, but you're not so concerned about the value they have, is going to be one resistance role. Uh, I'm going to talk more about that when we uh, reach the jewelry and what gems you're going to put in your jewelry. But let's just say you need one random, or not random, you don't want fire and you don't want lightning. So you're looking to have cold, poison or shadow resistance as the force affix. And you just need to have more than 31%. That's it. So you, need, you want one and you're likely to get the minimum value. The maximum life, this value here, scales is tied to the, in the eye level of your chest armor. So you, you, don't, you don't need to bother too much about it. It's if, if, it's, if it's an uh, high level 860 chest armor, then it's going to be whatever value is tied to that high, um, internal level. So you don't need to bother too much about it. You just need to have it. That's what you want. Okay, so that's it. Look for damage reduction from distance, the highest possible value, total armor, the highest possible value, and then look to have one resistance among shadow, cold, or poison, and it has to have a maximum life roll. The maximum life roll here is not multiplied by the percent increase given by your rubies. You see we have rubies in our gear, and it's not multiplied by your uh, paragon um, maximum life increase. Those is a percentage, so they multiply the, your life. But they don't, for a silly reason, they don't multiply the maximum life rolls on those items. You can only have that on pants, chest, helm, rings. And they don't multiply that. They multiply your base health, which is, which is tied to your level. Your level 100, you have a health pool equaling to X. 
This x number is going to be multiplied by the sum of all maximum life rolls in your paragons and maximum life rolls on your uh, gems, on, on your armor slots, that is. Right, so that's for the chest armor. Um, let's talk about, let's talk about the helm. Okay, I'm so sorry guys, it is a Shaco build. I'm looking to build a no Shaco uh, PvP starter build for Bold Lightning, but I have no uh, estimated time of arrival for when it's gonna be released. Like I'm, I'm doing, I'm releasing videos every day, so <laughs> I have a pile of ideas and things here and there that I want to cover on the channel. And this is one among them, so I'm so sorry guys, you will have to farm your Shaco if you want to assemble that. If not, maybe you can rock the exploiter while... I'm not too sure this uh, multiplier works, I think it works with dot damage, but not with flat damage. But anyway, um, yeah, sorry, I'll, I'll look into that, but do some PvE grind, kill Duriel, you know, again and again and again and again until you get your Shaco. And this Shaco is gonna help a lot in your adventures in PvP, okay? If there are like a tons of comments in this video saying, hey, I don't have a Shaco, please uh, do something for us, then I'll try to rush the uh, no Shaco PvP starter build. Right, this being said, this is best in slot and it's a wonderful item. The 25% general damage reduction, it's not like damage reduction against vulnerable or damage re reduction against uh, la la la, no no, it's period 20% damage reduction. It's so good that you don't have to think about anything to get, you know, you have your 9217 plus armor and you have your 45% damage reduction and you don't have to think about it, just focus on your gameplay. That's what's nice about this setup. It has uh, max life and cooldown reduction that we usually found on Helm. Uh, although the max life is a huge value, so it's uh, super nice to have that for your maximum life health pool. Uh, it has resource generation that you don't usually find on Helms, and it's super good. I will uh, touch on that when we discuss rings. And all stats, you can have that on a helm, it's not really necessary. It's gonna scale a little bit the damage multiplier you get from your intelligence. It's gonna scale a little bit the uh, all resistances, um, damage reduction you get, I mean, uh, scaling you get from your intelligence. But that's about it. And it's gonna do a few more things in terms of resource generation, critical strike chance, and dodge, but it's not... Uh, we are not getting that here for that. It happens to be here, it's not best in slots, um, live with that. So that's for the armory. Now let's look at the jewelry. Starting off, the amulet. Okay, the amulet is a very interesting spot for any theory crafter, any builder on any class in Diablo 4 because it can host either a defensive power, legendary power, either an offensive, legendary power, a mobility, legendary power or a utility legendary power and it's going to multiply whichever of those legendary power you choose by 1.5 so it's a very interesting spot when you're building a character or when, you, when you're doing your build I choose as best in slot for someone that wants to start in PvP rocking a ball lightning build and I doesn't want to think about a million thing when he's playing I chose the protector legendary power. I find it super solid. So the way it works is in the PvP zones uh, opponents, uh, other players, are considered elites for some things but not for everything but long story short they are elites. So when you're going to be damaging an opponent you're going to pop a shield that's gonna have that's going to have an absolutely insane value if you get it max rolled. How do you get it max rolled? You want an item that's gonna be around 925 internal level and that's going to have this legendary power of the protector uh, having a role on the closer, on the higher side, right? You're going to have to extract this uh, legendary power and imprint it on an amulet. And when you imprint it on the amulet, it's going to be 1.5 times the initial value that you extracted. And it can reach insane values, like more than 10,000 uh, barrier. So it's going to be super nice alongside your large health pool. Um, because it's going to last 10 seconds a few fights are going to take lo more than 10 seconds, but we're looking at the general case where, you know, you're doing your things here and there, uh, having a belt of uh, lightnings, if I may say, and then you're jumping on the opponent and you're doing damage to him. 
you have a 10 seconds window where you're going to have a huge, uh, you know, um, damage absorbing barrier. So I find it pretty nice in this, once again, starter build, uh, Bolt Lightning starter build. That's what I recommend you run. Looking at the affixes of this amulet, sorry, once again, for the uh, jewelry, I took a realistic 860 eye level. So this is going to influence how, how much uh, all resistance you get uh, from the, the prefix on the, those jewelry. So I use that value, which is realistically, you'll, you'll find something in this range. What you're looking for over there is uh, most important, I would say, damage reduction from distant enemies and mana cost reductions. Uh, you want those two rolls with high values. That's what you're looking for, okay? You could even rock an amulet that only has those two out of the four. That is perfectly fine. Your, your, your damage is fine. And if you're uh, starting in the PvP area, that's fine. You, you'll do more damage outplaying enemies than looking for raw power on your items at first. And then when you're competing in uh, Rifty Sports and you're in the semi-finals and finals, yeah, you get to optimize that. But we're not there yet, are we? Then if you find an amulet that has those two, the next two you're looking for, affixes that is, is uh, ranks to the Devouring Blaze passive because this is scaling a multiplier. It's doubling the value of the multiplier you get from uh, attacking enemies that are on fire, that are set ablaze. And you're looking for ranks of all mastery skills because ball lightning is a mastery skill. So you're scaling a multiplier that gets applied to the sum of the DPS of your um, wand and offhand. This is how it's calculated. The sum of those two things is then multiplied by the multiplier of the skill you're using and it's then multiplied by many things, multipliers from your parabola. Well, long story short, you, th those are the best in slot. Okay. Um, so that's about it for this. Uh, yeah, let's talk about the new unique uh, ring, the Tal Rasha Iridescent Loop. This thing is huge. It's best in slot in many, many sorcerer builds. And this PvP starter build is no exception. What it's gonna do for you is going to give you a 60% damage multiplier. 60 is a huge number for um, build standards. You know 40 is already big. We are usually more looking at uh, 20, 25, 30, 35%. So 40 is already big and 60, uh, it, it's a huge number for those standards. Um, how are we going to charge up all the way to 60%? We just have to do four types of elemental damage. The sorcerer has access to uh, cold, lightning, and fire. And thanks to season two, we have access to uh, poison damage. By doing those four types of damage, you're going to scale this multiplier to 60%, and that's a huge uh, damage increase. Now, let's look at the damage rotation because we are rocking this um, ring. First, you're, you'll be doing your things as usual. You'll have to pop ball lightnings, aren't you? Because you want to damage the enemy. This is lightning damage. Guess what? You're running the firebolt enchantment, which means anytime you deal direct damage from skills, this is di direct damage from skills, you're going to set ablaze an opponent. So it's going to deal burn damage for eight seconds. So you don't have to think about it. You're doing your things. It's already 30%. How about that one? Well, that one says, if you um, deal damage eight times on an enemy, so I have to say here that the frequency of damage on ball lightning is, uh, is very fast, it's very frequent, frequent, I'm so sorry. Normal, you're dealing with, uh, you know, electricity and uh, frequency in electricity, ha ha ha. So this thing is uh, hitting a million times a second. I'm just exaggerating a little bit. Uh, uh, I think the base value is 3.33 times a second, and you can scale it all the way to 10 times a second. Don't quote me on that because you caught me off guard. I don't have my notes over there. Maybe it's the other way around. Like it's uh, 0.3 scaling all the way to one. I'm so confused. Anyway, uh, I don't have my notes there, but it's uh, going to deal damage like very frequently within a second. And if you have, let's say, just five of them or 20 of them, then you're going to deal those eight uh, damage within a second or less than uh, 
uh, a second. And then you're going to deal poison damage. You don't have to think about anything. This is going to be 45% damage. Now, the tricky part, not tricky, but that's something you have to keep in mind. Before a fight starts, let's, see, let's say you see an opponent and you want to engage him, pop an ice blade on whatever, on a trash mob that's around or on the opponent himself. And don't think about it anymore. But you have to do that at the start of the fight to get the cold damage going. You don't care about this making the enemy vulnerable. You just want to have some cold damage done to something or someone at some point. Uh, preferably at the beginning of combat. So if there's like a density around you, trash mobs or an elite or whatever, then drop the ice blades on him, bang. You have your 60% multiplier dealt with. If not, pop it on the opponent. Uh, the good thing about Tal Rasha is, the way it works is, you don't have to do every type of damage every four seconds. Just do everything and then deal damage once uh, every four seconds, you're good to go. You don't have to think about it. So it's very likely that in combat you'll be engaging with the guy and in less than four seconds, you'll be doing some kind of damage to him. Well, maybe actually the tick of your uh, burn might do the job for you and you don't have to think about anything. I think, yeah, that's probably how it works. Like just um, pop this once, this, well, this is actually going to trigger that, which is going to trigger, not this, but yeah, you get the, you get the feeling. Like uh, I made it in a way that you don't have to think about too many things. Just think about, oh, an opponent, I'm going to pop ice armor, I'm going to pop ice blades on him and let's fight him. That's the spirit of this build. Let's talk affixes on those rings. The prefixes are super nice. Double, all resistance is very nice. Compared to on a regular ring, you would only get resistance to all elements, and then you would have one specific uh, element that's going to be covered. This one's nice, it covers everything. It's super nice to reach the caps on those uh, resistances. Then it has resource generation and lucky hit chance that we usually find and want for the most part on rings. It doesn't have critical strike chance, that's sad, but it's doing a lot of other things for us. So we'll be fine with it. It has cooldown reduction that you don't find anywhere, uh, that you don't find on rings usually. You can only have that on uh, Helm that we do have offhand that I, I didn't go all, all in about, but you could replace one role. We're gonna talk about that in a second and amulets that I choose not to include. So that's it, and non-physical damage is, uh, what do you call that, additive damage that's double dipping for us. Well, should be, because I had some news about um, some things not working as intended in PvP. More on that in a minute. So non-physical damage is supposed to double dip. It goes into the additive damage bucket and it uh, scales a multiplier that you have here, scaling with cold damage. Guess what? Cold is non-physical. So it will scale that all the way to 30. Um, finally, on the final ring. So this is your typical ring. Uh, no, it's not your typical ring. It's your typical PvP ring. You're looking to have maximum mana, resource generation, crit chance, and usually I like to have lucky hit chance on, in PvE, but in PvP you want this additional maximum life roll, even though it's not multiplied by your rubies and paragon. So um, that's it. Now let's talk about the legendary power. So to make it very accessible, I have choose to put Prodigy's Ring. This is where, depending on your experience, you can swap this for more damage. But I choose to have a very balanced setup. Every time you pop a cooldown, except for ball lightning, all those are cooldown and you have a way to reset your cooldowns. You're going to generate 25 mana times uh, the mana generation you have over there. So you won't lack mana, even if you're not optimizing how you generate mana with those pants. Just this will, will do the trick, you'll be fine. It'll be perfectly fine on the mana side if you roll this setup. If you're an experienced player, consider changing that for Conceited. Uh, this is a 25% damage multiplier when you have a buyer. That's what I would recommend to run. Okay, uh, now let's talk a little bit about mana generation. We have so many mana generation roles in that build. Rings, Offhand and um, Helm. How does that work? Let's say you generate uh, 50 mana 
Well, let's not take the maximum value. Let's let's say we don't have those 97.4%. Let's say we have 80%, which is more realistic because you're not going to have max roll everywhere except this. So uh, when you generate 50 mana by becoming unstoppable, it's actually 50 times 1.8. And this 50 is 90. Uh, your maximum mana pool should be around... 130 if you're not maxed out. So 90 out of 130 just by press. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry, you're getting more because of that. But this power is giving you 90. So it's huge. This power over there is 25 mana if you have it maxed rolled times 1.8. That's actually 45 mana every time you press a cooldown. What is it going to do for you? Well, you see an enemy. You want to engage him. Like, pop, bo pop ball lightning until you're empty mana, then press some cooldowns, maybe press... Uh, you're going to have to press Ice Armor and Ice Blade to begin begin your combat. So empty your mana pool and by having as many ball lightnings as you can have, then press uh, Ice Armor for extra protection and pop Ice Blades on an enemy somewhere. That's uh, some mana you recovered. Uh, you know, get more ball lightning and then jump on him. So you're going to have a, a, like a belt of, I don't know, 8 to 10 ball lightnings. That's how you set up your combat and that's the time you want to engage. So this uh, setup over here will allow you to do that, you know, empty your mana bar, do some things, empty your mana bar again, and then only think about how you're going to position yourself against your opponent. By doing that, you know, you're free of all the pesky things that can, you know, alter, uh, alter the way you're going to take on the fight. Focus on dodging things, dealing damage, positioning yourself in a smart way. And by removing unnecessary things you have to think about, you'll be um, progressing. <clears throat> you'll be mastering the build. That's what I had in mind when I designed this build to make it as accessible as possible. There are two other ways you can generate mana. It might be overkill, but once again, I really try to make this build as convenient to use for new players. So I have included here the fourth uh, affix. This one is on a lucky hit. You have a 5% chance to restore a percentage of your maximum mana. That's why we're happy to scale our maximum mana. The more maximum mana, the more this is going to give. And you might say, oh, wait, it's only a 5% chance on a lucky hit. And the lucky hit chance is very low on ball lightning. You know, so it's going to be like, uh, it's not going to trigger very often. Uh, yes and no. Yes, by looking at the numbers. No, by looking at the gameplay. You're looking to have a lot of ball lightnings around you. And those ball lightning attack very frequently. So on paper, it doesn't trigger very often, but the more, it's like you're in a casino and you're hitting that machine over and over again. If you hit that machine 1,000 times a second, assuming you have unlimited money, you're going to win faster than if you're just hitting once every second, correct? Well, that's the same, that's the same for how this is going to work out for you. You have two roles on that. One role on the gloves, one role on the offhand. And this, alongside everything else, is a no-brainer for your mana. Just don't think about it. It's going to be fine. Well, you won't think about it because it's going to be smooth anyway. So that's why I have included those two roles. If you're an experienced player and you know what you're doing, you're optimizing your skill rotation and picking up here and there uh, crackling energy when it matters, you can remove those two roles and you can go for intelligence on the gloves and here I would put cooldown reduction because if you're an experienced player you're looking to outplay your opponent and cooldown helps a lot. Maybe you would put also cooldown over there. Maybe you don't need that much damage. You need more to have cooldowns up when it really matters. Um, so And for the rest, look for crit chance, attack speed and lucky hit chance is a nice to have if you have those two rolls over there. Otherwise it can be an all stat roll if you're looking for more damage. That's how I would do things. Um, yeah, and we didn't talk about that. So for the offhand, you're looking to have a 925 internal level item because this is going to scale the flat damage to the maximum. It is tied to the eye level. And for the rolls, you're really looking to have mana cost reduction and resource generation. This is going to help a lot. Critical strike chance, you definitely need that, especially 
because we don't have this roll on the rings, on this ring where we usually get it, and we're not rocking the elementalist ring because I don't want you to think too much about your mana to optimize your critical strike chance. Just empty your mana, refill it, empty your mana, that is by uh, firing ball lightning, and you know, don't think about uh, casting things above a hundred percent, a hundred mana threshold. I don't want you to do that. So that's why it's set up this way. Um, for the legendary power, you're looking to have the storm swell. Now, I have to say, I have heard, um, like, thanks to the feedback I had on yesterday's video, thanks to everyone that has been reaching out to me, uh, some competitors have been reaching out and telling me that this vulnerable thing might not work in PvP, although it works in PvE. So we are looking at this um, storm swell power and this frigid fate node that might be not functioning at all in PvP. If someone has some data on that, I'll be very happy to hear it. And if that's the case, I will remake those Paragon boards still in a very optimized way and I will publish an update. Okay, otherwise, we are, I, I'm in doubt, I need to do some testing, I don't know when I can do some testing, honestly, but I need to do some testing in order to double check that, and if that's not the case, then you want to rock, maybe you put the conceited uh, legendary power over there in the meantime to be on the safe side. That's what you can do. So that's it for the gear. If you have any question on anything that I've said during this video, just um, ask in the comment sections. I respond to, I think, 100% of the comments. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll be looking for your questions and I can answer things if you want to, you know, get going with that build. I'll be very happy to see more people in the PvP areas and I think this video might help. So that's what we have here. Oh, we need to discuss about uh, resistance. All right, resistance, you're looking to max out on resistance. They are, the cap is the same, I believe, and I had some discussions with people here and there confirming that that's the case. So the maximum value you're gonna have here is 70%, and you can go beyond uh, this value. We are going to do that because we really want to be as tanky as possible in order for you to focus on gameplay and not on mechanics for surviving. So we are running this. When you're in combat, you're going to have plus 3% maximum resistance to a few things. To lightning, uh, cold, and fire. So you're, this is one way we're going to extend those. And we are running the... Enchanter Glyph in the starter board, because it's best in slot over there, it's a 70 intelligence board, and this thing is going to extend by plus 5% our maximum resistance to elements that we have in our enchantment slots. So in the meta, this setup over here is pretty nice, because in the meta, what do we have? We have Ball Lightning, that's Lightning Damage, Sorcerer. We have Firewall, Sorcerer, that's uh, Fire Damage. We have poison damage um, versus rogue. We have bleed damage versus barb, and druid and uh, necromancers are going to hate me for that, but in the meta they are, they are not non-existent, but there are very few of them. So that's mostly what you're going to face. For bleed barbs, uh, we, are, we, are, we are like at the maximum of armor, so we have 85% damage reduction against bleed. For fire socks, for firewall sorcerer, you're going to have 70 plus 10, that's 80 plus 3, 83. You're going to have 83% damage reduction against fire damage. That's pretty good against um, firewall sorcerers. Um, and for poison, you're going to be at 73, 70 plus somehow, I, don't, I, I have to check if it's still the case after the latest patch, but you don't, you're not casting any poison skill per se, but you're doing some poison damage. And there was this interaction, um, not this patch, but last patch, where you were getting 73% um, resistance to poison because of this node over there. Uh, if Can someone please confirm in the comments, or oh, it's on my to-do list to double check that. But then you're pretty good to go against uh, rapid fire poison rogues, or any poison rogues. Uh, how do we achieve that? 
we're, we're going to want to have some resist some gems in our jewelry. Okay, let's start with the ring. I'm so sorry. This is a bit messy. The, the, this ring over here, you want it to have lightning resistance as a prefix. Because in the Paragon board you have, you happen to have some lightning resistance over there. And by only getting a roll on an 860 eye level ring over there, you're going to max out your lightning resistance to 70 and turn that as, in, as 73 because you'll be uh, firing a few lightning spells. And this is great in the mirror matchup against other ball lightning sorcerers. So you really want to have a lightning resistance prefix on the ring over there because you only need that to achieve the cap there. You're saving resources, rolls, points, Legendary powers are all resources, and if you're choosing to have one, that's something else you can't have. Um, fire, you need just one. Uh, you do happen to have some fire resistance there. That's, uh, that's a lot of that, by the way. 20 plus 10, that's 30 you have in your Paragon board. So by just having a um, ruby in one of your jewelry, you're going to be reaching this 83% sweet spot for fire resistance damage against uh, Firewall Sorcerer. So pretty optimized setup over there. For cold resistance, you only need to have one um, gem, like this one, the blue one, to reach. Uh, so I kept it this way to show you where is the breakpoint. If you have 860 uh, high level items, on your jewelry and running this exact setup uh, in terms of Paragon, you're very close to the um, maximum. This gets capped out anyway as you uh, fire any skill because it's going to give you plus 9% all resistance. But I, I did things differently. I want you to have max resistance before you start combat with the only exception of the disobedience armor. But uh, see, if you have a little bit more than 860, you're going to reach the 70% base. So you don't have to think about anything. You'll be entering a combat without even doing anything with max resistances. It's going to help on your survivability. So maybe try to get a little bit more than 860. If you can't, it's not the end of the world because the moment you, f you launch one spell, you're going to be capped out. Uh, poison, okay, so for Poison, Cold, and Shadow, like I said, you're looking to have one roll over there that's going to have the same value than a gem, that is 30%, and whichever you have here, just put the two remaining gems over here and there. See, I have Shadow here, then I'm going to put Poison and Cold here. If I had Poison here, I would put Cold and Shadow over there, right? Very easy, very easy maintenance on that build, and that's how you're going to max out your resistances. Right, we did cover a lot already. Uh, let's talk about um, skill tree and enchantments. Um, uh, let me finish up first on the um, Vampiric powers. We did talk about this. Oh yes, there's a big thing we didn't cover. Vulnerable. How do you make enemies vulnerable? You need to. It's You have like damage multipliers that theoretically work against vulnerable enemies. Uh, so, and even if they don't work, you want to set them vulnerable. So you have at least a 1.2 damage multiplier against them. The way I choose to do it in this setup is uh, through metamorphosis. So that's something you have to, anyway, you'll be dashing around everywhere. Think about um, when you're fighting the guy, you just have to dash once through the enemy to apply Vampiric Curse on him and it's going to stay until the end of the combat, until he dies. So you only have to do it once and once he has the Vampiric Curse, you'll see the uh, Halloween icon, like the skull icon on top of him, above him I mean, uh, it means he's vulnerable. And that's it, you did it. You only have to dash through him once and you're good to go for the rest of the fight. That's the easiest way I choose to do it so that you don't have to think much about it. You'll be dashing around anyway, and then when you engage the fight, try to dash through him once. You'll then be capped out at 200% movement speed and try to stick to him so that uh, ball lightning is doing the damage. Or just try to dash, 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 dash all the way onto him and eventually he will become um, vulnerable. And you need to have this prey on the weak vampiric power to enable that. 
Last power, um, I find this one best in slot. It's not the best build to make the most out of this thing, but Undying is very strong. Uh, it's like your vampire, but not really. Do vampire uh, heal from thin air? I don't think so. That's what this power is doing for you. When you cast a spell, it doesn't matter if there is a target, then you're going to heal 3% of your maximum life. And that's sustain. That's very good. Look, uh, yes, look at yesterday's video to understand how the sorcerer class deals, uh, uh, has access to sustain. It's through barriers. And we don't really have access to that, except there's a few exceptions, but they are very wonky to uh, run in PvP. Uh, this one's great. So it's going to give you life sustain. You don't have access to that in the Sorcerer Kit otherwise. And it's done out of thin air. Like uh, every time you throw a ball lightning, even if there's no enemy, that's going to be 3% maximum life that you just recovered. So that's best in slot. Right. So we're done with the Vampiric Powers. Let's move on to the skill tree. Um, I want to cover the first enchantment first. Uh, for safety, like uh, for new players, this thing here is going to do a lot for you. The Flame Shield enchantment is a cheat death, and you can scale the duration of this cheat death. Uh, it, we, if it has no points, I believe it's a 2.1 or it's 2.0. It's it, it lasts for two seconds when you're dead. Well, guess what? You're not dead, and you have two seconds of invulnerability. If you put four points into that, that's 2.4 seconds of invulnerability. With Shaco, that's 0.4 additional seconds. So it's not showing there, but it's 2.8 seconds. I didn't go crazy all the way on that, having ranks to um, Flame Shield on your boots and having ranks to defensive skills on your amulets to go to an insane value when you have a Harlequin quest. I tried to balance things, but just know that you could scale this uh, like a lot more. 7, 11, um, 14, you're looking at 3.5 seconds of invulnerability when this is maxed out. And in the skill rotation, it's going to be very nice. Let's look again at how we approach an enemy. Fire as many ball lightning as you can. Refill your mana. Do it again. Maybe refill your mana and do it again. You know, until you're satisfied with the amount of ball lightnings that are orbiting around you thanks to this legendary power over there. Then, pop um, ice blade, pop ice armor. So you have a shield that you're going to use for sustain, for barrier sustain. Then pop uh, ice blade on the enemy. Boom, he's uh, been dealt cold and fire damage. Now, Jump on him and do your things. Try to kill him. Let's say he kills you. He deals a lot of damage to you. You will hear this flame shield enchantment popping. Means you have to know you have, uh, what's the window again? Two, let's say you have around two and a half seconds, but like count in your head for two seconds, you're invulnerable. Continue your things. Try to kill him. After the two-ish seconds, pop it once more. So that's another 2.4 seconds where you can die and a monitor count in your head for two seconds. Before you die again, <laughs> or die period, pop a deep freeze. It's going to uh, reset, it's going to set you um, um, invulnerable, immune, in the, the, that's the key word, and it's going to reset all your cooldowns. Once you exit deep freeze, pop again flame shield. So all in all, it, it has been around seven seconds and a half where they couldn't kill you. That's very valuable, okay? So if you're a new player, that's why I did put this uh, ultimate skill. Mm, if you're experienced, we'll talk about it in a, in a second. So that's the rotation I have for you. If you're a new player, you don't want to die. You want to learn about how to engage combat, how to dodge things, how you can improve things. And this is best done when you're not dying for seven and a half seconds when, when you should, okay? Uh, and you're going to have a lot of uh, bar, uh, shields here and there popping, uh, you know, in the meantime, that are really making sure that you don't die in the first place. And if you do, you don't die. <laughs> so that's how it works. Um, so that's how you want to um, do your spell rotation. Now, one thing, um, when you're going to face an experienced player, he will know there's a window where he can kill you between the end of your deep freeze and the beginning of your next flame shield. There's a delay when you exit deep freeze uh, before you really have your flame shield up. And if your opponent is experienced, he will kill you in between. Um, and 
moreover, if you have a higher ping, if your ping is 100 or something, if it's not like between 5 and 30, there's going to be an additional lag input by the time you become uh, invulnerable immune, that is, again. So just know that. Uh, if you're facing someone that's new, he won't notice that. If he's experienced, he will know that and he will try to go for the juggler in between those two skills. There is a little bit of a mind game with Deep Freeze because you are the one to choose when it ends. You can press it again to choose to end it now. So there's a little bit of a mind game as to, okay, maybe I can try to hide play him because he's not expecting me, like he's running away for a moment, expecting this to last the full, full four seconds. I'm going to end it prematurely so that I can really pop my flame shield and teleport or evade back onto the guy. So there's some leeward on the outplay potential of this. But I really included that for you to experience for as long as possible the fights without dying. So that's why it's meant to be like that, right? Um, and that should be it for the skill rotation. So let's touch on the uh, ultimate skill. So that's what I recommend to run if you are new or casual, let's say. If you know what you're doing, uh, it, I think it's better in my book to run unstable currents. You would just remove th those three points over there, put two here. Yeah, this is bugged, by the way. We'll, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and the last point where you can put it, where is it? The two out of three, you could put it here. This is how I would run it. Uh, if not, oops, you want to run it this way. Uh, why? What's different when you run unstable currents? Well, when you think you know you have the window to kill your opponent when the shouts of a barbarian are down on, or where an opposing sorcerer has already burned all his uh, flame shields and deep freeze and everything and you know now is the time to kill him and you want to go for the juggler, then pop unstable current and jump on him and burst him out. That's how I would uh, recommend to play it if you're more experienced. This is more a I will burst you right here, right now spell. Then, you know, I pop it at the beginning of the combat and do my thing. So learn first the um, fights. And once you're experienced in that, use this for the burst. That's what I would recommend if you want to swap a few points. Um, yeah, bug the things. All right, you know what? What's the uh, best way to play this build? Like that. But we're not playing fire. Yeah, tell that to Blizzard. So it seems this thing over here is not doing anything. It's not increasing your damage, so I'm suspecting that it's not uh, decreasing the damage you take also, like the second part of the spell. So this is void. And guess what? Uh, re you can read this as your non-physical critical strike damage, because it works with lightning. Uh, well, I'm not sure with um, cold, so don't quote me on that. But for that build, you can run that. It reads, your lightning critical strike damage is increased by a multiplier of 25% against blah, blah, blah. Your, your lightning critical strike chance is increased by plus 5%, blah, blah, blah. And if you kill a random mob, on the map, like a, a, a trash mob on the map, you're going to be benefiting from those two bonuses for three seconds. So either you kill something and, oh, there's an, 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 a player there and you jump on him and, and do your things, or depending on the health pool and the um, current life, I mean, of the opponent, it's going to do nice things for you. And it's a bug, so that sucks. Because uh, as a theory crafter, I prefer to, you know, base my choices out of walking things instead of, okay, bug number one, you have to do this. Bug number two, you have to do this. Bug number, you know. Anyway, so if it's fixed, this is best in slot. But, well, right now, just play it like that, I guess. If it works in PvP, by the way. Because I had the, the uh, intel from PvE. I'm not even sure it works in PvP. Otherwise, when this is fixed in the long run, you want to be running the Veer's Mastery. So this one's interesting. Um, so that's a damage multiplier when it works. And it's doing something nice. Um, the, your opponent deals X percent less damage to you is uncapped as per my knowledge. My understanding is that you can stack as much of this value over here because it's a debuff you apply to the opponent and it's not going into this 45% damage reduction cap. So you have two of those, electrocution, 
reducing the damage he deals or she deals by 15% for 5 seconds if you crit him or her. And Veer's Mastery, reducing the damage uh, they take by 20%, and if you crit, that's around 25%. That's 24 something. So having those two, you get even tankier, which is nice. Remember, this is a, a very optimized build in terms of armor damage reduction resistance, maximum life, uh, up to 20,000 life, and barriers. You have a huge 13,000 barrier and a few more, uh, like just popping ice armor is uh, 6,000 plus... 6,000, that's uh, 12,000 plus, let's say 12,000, let's round it to 25. Yeah, you're beginning combat with uh, 35,000 life and shield to play with, and you have some recovery built in uh, with those two nodes. So, you know, pretty solid. So another way to reduce the damage they do is by running those two, and I just love them. I think that's for new players, casual or non-pro veterans, that's a solid setup in my book. For the rest, and I had some few points to spare, so your barrier is going to last a little bit longer. Uh, for the rest, it's the usual suspects we're running in any ball lightning build. You want as many skill points over there. You want them to generate crackling energy. As you pick them up, it's going to give you mana. You have a little bit more um, crackling energy forming over there, even if this happens very, very, uh, not very often. You scale uh, the Devouring Blaze multiplier because you have this uh, fire, like burning uh, synergies in the reactions. This is just here for Talrasha. Yeah, you have a few spare points, so lucky hit chance is better to increase the chance of you triggering those two affixes. This one is your sustain, you want three points in that and you want a large health pool. This is also your sustains, and if the enemy is vulnerable, this is not a 5% of your damage, it's a 10%. I think, or 7.5% uh, of the damage you do that uh, funnels into your barrier, into your shield. You could get rid of that, but I think it's pretty nice to have another multiplier for the drawback of taking a little bit damage, a little bit more damage. You're already very tanky. This one's super nice. Um, it will trigger here and there. You have to pay attention to your mana, to your skill bar. If you're not into that, don't look at your skill bar, and sometimes you will have the opportunity to, you know, extend even further. And uh, 2.5 seconds plus 2.5 seconds plus 2.5 seconds plus, hey, it got reset, 2.5 seconds. That 10 seconds you were not able to die. You know, that's nice. Uh, and you have a ton of points in teleport because of this to reduce the cooldown. We're not running those two because we're already capped out on damage reduction, so we don't want the shimmering teleport. And this one deals near to nothing for us. We want that to be on the safe side, and there's one point we have to put over here to access the rest. Uh, maximum mana, even just three, is the best in slots. We have two points to put over here. You could put this one over there, like you could do your cold damage with this basic spell, but I don't think you want to do that. And this is your enchantment. So that's it for the skill tree and enchantments. Finally, let's look at the Paragon board. Okay. How do I approach that? I could have optimized it more, but for consistency with my PvE builds that I covered on the channel, uh, it's going to use the same board adjustment, and then you only have to move some points here and there as you swap between those. So that's that's how I choose to do it, because let's say you assemble this one for PvP, you're having a good time on Sunday, you're playing all day long, and then on Monday night you want to do some PvE, and you're like, eh, maybe I should... Well, you, you don't really need to optimize it, because this bust build is busted as F in PvE anyway, but you're just going to move some points here and there. What did I change mostly from the other version? I looked for maximum life um, nodes, that I didn't take in the PvE version because you really want to get to those sweet 20k, uh, you know, life pool. It's going to... Some some people that are not going to run and optimize PvP build will be like, I can't kill that guy. His health bar is not going down. And that's the feeling you want to have. Uh, some people that, are, that have good builds or are experienced in PvP will be able to challenge you. But for the most part, I think this is a very solid start. For the rest, so in order to include that, I had to cut some additive points here and there. So let's say this is version uh, 
There has to be a version 1.1 in the light of the information I received between yesterday and today uh, by um, pro players on things here and there. They fed me some intel, thanks very much, by the way, on things that might not be working as, as intended is a bit of an extent, <laughs> but that are not working properly in PvP. We are looking at this node over there, not doing damage. So that's one of the things I might change in the future. If you have some intel, you have really confirmed that that's the case, I'd be very happy to hear about that. Um, otherwise, go for that setup until I modify it once more. So I had to, and yes, where are you? The I heard also, didn't test it, that the exploit, that anything you get beyond the initial 20% damage you deal to vulnerable goes to waste, just like in season one for non-dot damage, that is. And I didn't test that, but if that's the case, well, we'll have to get rid of the exploit glyph also. The multiplier is nice, but we are losing all the, um, you know, vulnerable damage that's supposed to go in the additive bucket, but I heard stories that is not the case. So just know that. Uh, if you test things, please let me know. I'll update that, and it will be this, you know, public, PvP starter board that you know every new player is going to run when you find them in the fields of hatred. That's a s solid, decent build. You know they're running that, so you have the edge even if you're a pro player. But you know, if you give me that information, you might not be get keeping things that will give you a super high competitive edge. But in the long run, you will see more players in the PvP area. Well, hell, it's up to you. I'm just, I'm doing my part. This is my, the message in the bottle I'm throwing out in the sea. If someone wants to pick it up, um, you know, just, just, if you want to see more players in the PvP area. Um, for the rest, so same setup, we're scaling non-physical damage wherever we can, because we're assuming that this works. And it scales with cold damage, so that's a double dip. Scaling a multiplier while adding in at the same time the uh, overloading, if I may say, the uh, additive bucket. That's how you do it with the um, you know Paragon board. That's where you want to do it, not on your gear. Uh, I'm still assuming that critical strike damage beyond 1.5 is not going to waste. It's just going to the additive bucket. So that's why we still have this over there. Uh, uh, territorial is very nice for the 15% damage reduction. That's one less roll you have to take on your gear. And this is additive damage, so it's nice. I did cut some points, additive points here and there, huh, to have to get the uh, maximum life rolls wherever I can. This is for non-physical damage, double dipping. Exploit, uh, we're not sure if it works. Um, flame feeder. Well, we are running burning. Um, what's it called? Uh, devouring blaze. So we might as well get this 10% uh, damage multiplier and some uh, additive damage. Uh, and this one's very important. Um, it makes ball lightning 20% uh, bigger, which is nice because when you stand on top of a boss, you're sure that every ball lightning that's orbiting around you is gonna hit the boss. Super cool. The Hit, it's not the hitbox, the, the sock, the, like the size of an opponent is not a super huge boss, so not everything's gonna hit, but these things certainly helps a little bit. And that's some additive damage. Um, I will conclude saying that what you have here might not be the super top of the board, best optimized, but I think it's very solid. And when you drop into any PvP forum or wherever on the internet and say, hey, I'm new to PvP, can please someone give me a starting build so I can try uh, the fields of hatred? You're gonna hear silence. Well, that silence is gone. Have this, my friend, try it. Venture in the PvP zone. Find some other people, find some friends that want to, you know, play PvP also. Give them this build and say, hey, I know you rolled a sorcerer because it was maybe the most popular class of season two. Let, let's head into the um, fields of hatred. Let's, let's go the two of us and try to have some fights going on. Then you have something to start with. That's the first build I'm going to cover. I have no ETA for the no Sheiko version. I want rather to work on the um, flame, what's it called again? Um, sorry, didn't sleep much. The uh, firewall version, I'll give you a second starter build, which is going to be the firewall sorcerer, a dot build, very efficient in PvP also. 
And I'm a main sork, so I don't want to overextend and give you something that might be completely crap if I try to cover other classes. But at least, hey, you're gonna have two starter build as a sorcerer to have fun in the fields of hatred. So that's gonna do it for me today for this video. Tomorrow, oh, by the way, there's a nice competition going on tonight. That's the EU, European uh, League for uh, PvP tournaments. Uh, that's going to be held on the um, Rift Esports Twitch channel and you'll find a replay on the Rift Esports YouTube channel. If you want to compete, they have a Discord server. I'm going to link everything in the description of this video. Tonight's the night, we're Saturday night, that's the European League, both amateur and pro. If you want to, you know, rumble, then head over there, I'd say. Otherwise, uh, that's the second video of this series of three. Tomorrow's videos will be about the meta game. With yesterday's video, you know what are those hidden invisible walls in the PvP maze. So you can get your way through. Today you have one and then you'll have a, t a second starter build. Tomorrow you're going to learn everything I know. I'm not the most knowledgeable person, but I do know some things about the meta game. What you'll be facing. Um, and when to fight and when not to fight. I'll be trying to convey that information in tomorrow's video. And it's going to be the final video in this mini-series dedicated to PvP. You guys have a lot of fun in the fields of hatred. This is Wismaril signing off. I'll see you guys tomorrow. Have a great weekend. Have a nice day.